Thank you very much. Thank you uh, for the introduction. I will start um, uh, uh, sort of talking about my research, um, and I will stay close to the uh, topic uh, and uh, the part of my research that is associated with the memo uh, attached to this presentation. So, um, Poners had uh, published uh, a memo uh, which uh, sort of uh, was uh, related to one of the um, one of the chapters of the book manuscript I'm working on right now. So let me share my uh, my screen with you. Can you see the screen? Can you see my um, presentation? Okay. All right. Thank you very much. So this uh, uh, sort of uh, what I will talk about is about how does the Russian state rule its the economy, and we have. Sort of a number of scholars who are uh, invested on uh, the nature of the Russian uh, sort of uh, uh, on the uh, style with which uh, Russian authoritarian state um, manages its economy, and sort of we we see those uh, uh, the Piranha capitalism, the pat uh, patrimonial capitalism, crony capitalism, bad governance. Uh, all those things sort of, you know, um, in uh, my research, I want to add to that description of the uh, Russian state rule by closing, lo uh, looking closer at the um, um, at the development of regulatory regimes, official regulatory regimes uh, in Russia. I will show you just uh, sort of to, to demonstrate the proliferation of official regula uh, regulatory statutes and bylaws uh, in uh, Russia. This is a regional data. This is at regional level what's happening. Uh, very similar uh, trends are at the national level. So, uh, you know, this is this is simply the, the number of of um, official regulations that have been adopted by regional authorities over the years. And this is the overall length in words of those regulations, right? So we see this tremendous increase in the official uh, sort of mechanisms by which the uh, Russian state um, sort of regulates uh, economic activity. So um, I try uh, so in the book manuscript, I document this development and I find that it is quite consequential. I'm sorry for uh, the uh, thing appearing at the bottom of the uh, page. I was trying to uh, tweak it uh, last minute, but nothing helped. So um, if uh, when I analyze that development, I quite interestingly find that um, it, when we look at the regional uh, dynamics, that uh, this growth of official regulatory corpus in Russian regions is actually associated with positive outcomes in the private sector economy. We see that the internally generated um, uh, direct investment uh, 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 in, uh, in those regions with more developed uh, official regulatory norms is higher uh, then in regions with underdeveloped uh, regulations, we see the total number of uh, small businesses larger, and we also see those businesses generating more revenue in the regions with more developed official regulatory corpus. So um, I ask myself, what is going on, right? So how and why uh, does the uh, Russian state uh, make those choices in developing um, more specific um, and more detailed uh, official regulatory arrangements, right? And this brings me to the theoretical part of my research, where I look at whether there is such thing as an autocratic regulatory state and whether the, uh, the nature of uh, Russian uh, political regime has anything to do with the development of those uh, official regulatory norms, right? So um, I consider both the economic considerations 
considerations. Uh, it's the, the considerations of growth and uh, efficiency for the uh, Russian authoritarian state, but also the political considerations. And here, really, we're dealing with the, uh, with the generic politician's dilemma of whether to uh, provide frameworks that are beneficial for the provision of public goods, sort of that, that management of general public interest, versus creation of the opportunities to benefit the special interest, right? And in that sense, uh, Russian uh, uh, authoritarian politics is no different from any other kind of political regimes. All those considerations underpin all kinds of choices when it comes to regulatory uh, uh, norm creation. However, I find that autocracy, so if from that standpoint, autocracies are no different from democracies uh, in the political underpinnings of regulatory cho choices. However, what I find in my research is that autocracies are fundamentally different from democracies in the types of implementation mechanisms for their official regulatory uh, environment. So if democracies uh, um, have um, uh, developed exposed mechanisms of political control over regulatory enforcement mechanisms on the part of the state institutions, uh, democracies of uh, other side, transparency, public accountability, free press, um, autocracies lack it. And we, we have a body of research that documents Post mechanisms of control uh, over uh, bureaucracies in uh, in Russia. So uh, increasingly, the Russian state has to rely on the ex ante mechanisms of disciplining their bureaucracies and ensuring that they work towards providing uh, public uh, public goods and generating environment that is conducive to the general well-being of the economy, right? And here, the statutory mechanism, uh, sort of mechanisms, uh, uh, writing specific laws uh, and giving specific official instructions to uh, the bureaucrats becomes uh, particularly instrumental, right? So, um, what uh, what are these mechanisms of what are the specific um, sort of elements of the design of the regulatory enforcement uh, mechanisms? Um, I uh, sort of uh, review the literature uh, on on the relationship uh, between the political authorities and their executive agencies, and um, I find that in general there is general con uh, sort of consensus that more detailed, more specific regulations tend to promote better governance, governance, uh, and creation of uh, collective goods, while uh, the uh, vague. Uh, regulations, they um, lead to the discretionary implementation of the regulatory policy, uh, economic policy, social policy, and they can be used as a tool for creating particularistic benefits for the key constituencies of the authoritarian regimes, right? So, um, I uh, sort of reason that autocrats want to constrain their regulatory um, uh, agencies, their, their state bureaucracy, when they uh, value the aggregate economic performance over those kleptocratic rents that can be created through the, uh, the those vague uh, regulatory regimes and discretionary policy implementation. So, um, you know, in the memo that uh, Poners had uh, published, um, I talk about how uh, the decline in the oil rents increases of the amount of bureaucratic constraints that we see in those uh, more detailed, specific, and numerous official regulatory norms. I also talk uh, a bit about how popular mobilization tends to decrease uh, 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 um, sort of increasing of, of the popular mobilization uh, also leads to those um, I'm sorry, the errors are uh, wrong here on the on the um, um, on on this chart. So with the rise of popular mobilization, we also want to see more bureaucratic constraints. So both areas should uh, point up because the popular uh, mobilization uh, makes it more important for the autocrats to cater to the creation of more beneficial environments sort of to quell down those, uh, those uh, mobilization and protests. So this is what, um, you know, I examine with the data uh, to 
save time. I think I'm uh, already sort of uh, running uh, uh, over uh, uh, over my time a little bit, right? Or close to there. So I will not talk much about the nature of sort of the, the sources of uh, of uh, my data and the nature of the data. I will be happy to talk about this in uh, Q and A if we have a chance, or you know, to respond with uh, to, uh, to to questions in the chat. Um, I want to get to my concluding point. I do find in my research that then oil revenues decline, autocrats tend to develop more regulations and uh, sort of uh, more numerous and more specific regulations. I, I also find that um, when the, um, the incidence of popular protests increase, autocrats tend to adopt you know, more uh, uh, numerous and more specific regulations, right? Which lines up with, with that logic that, um, you know, uh, when uh, autocrats are trying to cater to or achieve greater economic and, uh, efficiency, um, they uh, resort to that tool of constraining the discretionary power of their um, uh, of their bureaucratic agencies uh, by writing those more numerous, more specific um, regulations. Um, so I do sort of think that uh, one of the important element uh, uh, elements that characterizes the nature of uh, developing or the emerging and strengthening uh, Russian regulatory state is the use of those ex ante mechanisms, sort of the, the statutory mechanisms and more detailed bylaws. Um, uh, to discipline bureaucrats strategically in times when the political foundations of the regime are shaken uh, through either the lack of resources uh, that are used for, uh, for uh, buying up the support of the population or the rises uh, of the rise in popular mobilization that might threaten the survival of the regime. So I will stop here. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, the opportunity to discuss this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Denisa, for your presentation. And now I would like to give the floor to Vladimir. Yeah, uh, uh, is it all right so everybody is able uh, to uh, to hear me? We good. Yeah, great. We good. Uh, yeah, uh, I uh, will be uh, talking today uh, uh, about uh, my uh, policy memo, uh, which uh, represents uh, a part of. Um, uh, uh, forthcoming uh, special issue uh, for uh, the journal European Studies. Uh, the uh, special issue is devoted uh, to uh, various dimensions uh, of uh, governance uh, in Russia, uh, ranging from uh, governance uh, in the uh, academia to uh, uh, um, uh, uh, urban governance uh, in uh, the city of uh, Moscow and uh, uh, our uh, introductory uh, essay uh, written together with uh, my uh, colleague uh, uh, Margarita Zavatska actually uh, 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 represent, uh, yeah, uh, represent <coughs> the core of uh, this, uh, this memo. Uh, how we can explain uh, uh, the quality of governance uh, in Russia and uh, what uh, kind of uh, incentives uh, uh, is provided by uh, Russia's uh, uh, political uh, institutions. But first, uh, let me start from uh, visual representation of uh, bad governance. Uh, this uh, picture is a, a fresco 
uh, uh, written uh, in 14th century, and it is still located uh, in uh, the town hall of uh, Italian uh, uh, city of uh, Siena. Uh, one can uh, imagine uh, that uh, the face uh, at the very center of this um, uh, uh, fresco uh, looks uh, very much uh, familiar for many observers uh, of Russia, but no, this is not Vladimir Putin. Uh, even thought uh, the uh, face looks uh, uh, very much similar. Uh, this is a symbol of uh, tyranny. Uh, uh, persons below uh, represents uh, various uh, deadly scenes. And uh, the figure uh, in uh, uh, at the bottom uh, is a swaddled uh, symbol of justice. This is how uh, 14th century uh, painter Ambrosio Lorenzetti uh, uh, perceived uh, the nature of uh, bad governance. And I would say that uh, uh, this uh, representation uh, not uh, lost uh, its relevance up to uh, uh, present day. So what went wrong with uh, the quality of governance uh, in Russia is uh, uh, that uh, uh, the conventional wisdom uh, uh, linked uh, the quality of governance with the degree of social economic development. Uh, but uh, uh, Russia in many of uh, dimensions of quality of governance uh, performed uh, much uh, worse than uh, it uh, uh, was according to um, GDP per capita and so on and so forth. Uh, here is uh, uh, the slide uh, why Russia is not uh, Burkina Faso. Uh, Burkina Faso uh, was um, uh, chosen uh, because uh, many years ago uh, there was a, a famous statement uh, about the Soviet Union as an uh, upper world of his rockets. Uh, uh, exactly at that year, uh, uh, the upper world was renamed uh, as uh, Burkina Faso, and if you have a look on these numbers, you will figure out that uh, in uh, five out of six uh, major indicators uh, of quality of governance from the World Bank, from Transparency International, from World Justice Project, uh, Russia performed uh, worse than uh, Burkina Faso, which is one of the poorest uh, African nations. So uh, one can imagine that uh, something uh, went wrong and we have to, uh, to explain why there is a, a huge uh, disjuncture between a uh, relatively high degree of socioeconomic development and uh, uh, very uh, poor performance uh, of uh, Russia uh, in uh, terms of quality of government. What are the most popular uh, explanations? One is uh, Putin is guilty. Uh, uh, Karen Davisha, Anders Osland, and some other scholars uh, wrote a very popular uh, analysis uh, which uh, accused uh, um, Putin in building uh, uh, crony capitalism, uh, 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 mafia state, and the like. Uh, Actually, it's not always uh, correct because Putin invested uh, uh, certain efforts in improving quality of governance uh, during his uh, first term in office. And uh, moreover, if you will have a look on uh, developments in other parts of the former Soviet Union, you will find out that uh, the picture is uh, not so much uh, dissimilar. So even if Putin is uh, guilty, it's not uh, only about Putin. Yet another uh, approach is that Russia is guilty. And uh, there is a strong tradition of focusing on part dependency, bad legacies, uh, uh, patrimonialism, uh, 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 whatsoever. Uh, and uh, there is an assumption that Russia uh, uh, cannot be governed uh, uh, decently and uh, uh, never will be so. Uh, my understanding is that uh, such a determinism uh, is uh, heavily unproductive and uh, this uh, approach uh, cannot be uh, used as a tool for explanation because the picture uh, of uh, bad governance in Russia is uh, not so uh, monotonic. Uh, we uh, observe uh, some instances of uh, really successful performance uh, like uh, uh, macroeconomic and uh, anti-inflation policy of the central bank or uh, tax reform or whatsoever. And uh, uh, there is a need of more uh, 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 fine-tuned uh, explanation. 
So what do we mean by uh, bad governance uh, is a, a sort of political economic uh, order uh, when uh, the state is governed uh, in order to steal it as much as possible and as long as possible. And what uh, observed by international agencies uh, such as uh, the World Bank, like a lack of the rule of law or uh, low regulatory quality or corruption are just working mechanisms uh, which uh, maintain uh, bad governance as a, a functioning model. And uh, this is uh, 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 what uh, different in uh, uh, bad governance uh, uh, in Russia and in some other states. It's not a deviation, it's a norm. That's uh, the difference. And uh, we assume that bad governance is uh, an agency driven phenomenon. Uh, in uh, newly built uh, authoritarian regimes, uh, which uh, faced with uh, the lack of opportunities for uh, hereditary succession. And uh, there is a famous argument uh, of uh, Mansour Olson about uh, behavior of uh, uh, short uh, uh, sighted rulers as roving bandits. Uh, and roving bandits uh, tend uh, to uh, govern uh, their uh, respective uh, uh, fiefdoms uh, very poorly. And post-Soviet roving bandits uh, are probably not an exception. Uh, of course, uh, uh, in the real world, uh, apart from uh, hereditary successions, uh, there are uh, two types of constraints. Uh, international constraints uh, because of uh, international uh, competition and major wars uh, between countries, which uh, uh, provide strong incentives uh, to improve quality of governance. Otherwise, uh, you uh, will be uh, 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 taken over by your rivals. Uh, and domestic conflicts because of um, uh, uh, spread of violence uh, and need for law and order. But the problem is that uh, uh, these constraints are more or less historical. They are matters of the past. And when uh, these constraints are weak uh, and uh, insufficient, uh, then bad governance become a norm, especially against uh, the background of uh, uh, globalization. And uh, uh, our co-panelist, uh, Gulnas, actually uh, wrote an excellent article where uh, she was, uh, uh, Karen Davisha demonstrated that. Uh, internationalization uh, provided uh, uh, misincentives uh, for improving uh, quality of governance uh, in Russia, and not only in Russia, uh, and uh, therefore uh, Russia uh, feeds uh, uh, a different uh, argument uh, that bad policy is a good politics and uh, 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 bad governance actually is functional mechanism for maintaining uh, political status quo. And uh, we know that there is a huge variety of quality of governance uh, among uh, autocracies, and uh, Russia uh, probably is in the middle. Overall, the quality of governance is bad, but uh, there are numerous uh, pockets of effectiveness and even uh, some uh, success stories. Uh, so there is a need uh, to explain why, uh, why uh, despite bad governance, uh, Russia not, uh, is a failed state and sometimes uh, uh, performed successfully. This is a, a, a need for technocratic mechanism because governing in most uh, sensitive and strategically important uh, sector uh, should be in uh, right hands and uh, there is a demand of ruling groups uh, for efficient uh, technocratic solutions. And yet there are some uh, examples of uh, successful uh, economic policies uh, if uh, they coincided with the critical mass of influence uh, of uh, uh, technocrats and uh, their efforts uh, brought uh, rapid and uh, 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 demonstrative uh, policy, uh, positive policy effects. Uh, but uh, this uh, winning combination is uh, relatively, uh, relatively rare. And uh, 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 this uh, uh, lead us to a, a question uh, what uh, we might expect uh, for uh, the future. And uh, the basic expectation is that uh, the current uh, status quo of bad governance will be preserved uh, against the background of uh, political continuity. And uh, yet there are some attempts uh, of improving quality of governance along uh, the lines of what we call uh, 3D as uh, deregulation, digitalization, and uh, decentralization. 
But the problem is that uh, uh, 4D, uh, the fourth dimension of this D is democratization, is not uh, on the current agenda. And even if uh, and when it will happen, uh, probably there will be a lot of uh, difficulties uh, for improving quality of governance. And in this respect, uh, Ukraine, uh, after the overthrow of Yanukovych, uh, may be uh, a prime example of how many problems uh, this country faced uh, uh, with improving quality of governance and uh, uh, if uh, these changes will be postponed uh, for uh, decades or so, uh, it may uh, be even more difficult uh, to overcome this bad governance uh, trap uh, in Russia. Let me stop here and uh, I will be happy to continue during uh, Q&A uh, section. Thank you. Sorry, I was disconnected. Sorry, I was disconnected. <laughs> I'm back, I think. <laughs> Thank you so much, uh, um, Vladimir. Let me now give the floor to Gunnaz. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. All right, uh, I will uh, go against the trend and not uh, present any slides and just talk myself. Um, so <laughs> whether I should apologize or not, let's see. So if you read Medusa yesterday, October 8th, um, there was an interesting article uh, about uh, Moscow developments and a piece about Sabianin, Moscow mayor, uh, who, uh, uh, who was seen as a mayor who is developing a new security special services um, type uh, organization because Moscow government mandated that all Moscow employers send 30% of their workforce to work from home and that they submit all the information about those who work from home to the mayoral office, including their personal phone numbers, the numbers of their cars and whatever transportation cards that they have, supposedly for the mayoral office and the mayoral services to be able to uh, go out and <clears throat> basically uh, uh, do a surveillance type operation uh, over whether they are working from home or are taking walks on the streets or doing their own stuff. So this move presumably was driven uh, by the concerns about the second wave of the pandemic in Moscow, but it did raise worries about the legality of this move uh, because the law does not necessitate employees to give personal information to their employers. So employees can give their, you know, their, 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 their labor, but not necessarily personal phone numbers. Uh, and of course, then the conversation goes into the direction of whether we live in the emergency, whether this is an emergency time or not. But I'm using this example, which is just, uh, you know, as uh, unfolding uh, as of yesterday and today, is to bring attention to the issue that um, we uh, uh, researched from uh, one perspective um, in our um, working paper and about which I wrote in the uh, policy memo about digital governance, digital means of governing uh, authoritarian systems, sometimes referred to and using the terms uh, digital authoritarianism, sometimes uh, referring uh, to informational autocracies. So there is this new literature that's, that is being built around these terms and uh, around the uh, authoritarian governments using these new technologies for the means of legitimation and for the means of also providing public goods in their countries. Most literature looks into China, but there is now growing literature that is looking into Russia as well. I'm going to share uh, just uh, the results of um, our uh, research that looks into digital means of governance in Moscow in relation to road management and specifically managing or collecting information about potholes uh, from uh, in Moscow and uh, basically looking into the political effects of pothole complaints um, in, in Moscow. So this policy memo is co-authored uh, with um, uh, GW PhD in economics, Nissan Gorgulu, uh, although we have one more co-author for the larger paper. And um, so let me just uh, go quickly. Moscow, of course, 
has been uh, noted to be a leader in this digital transformation and among the various um, smart cities around the world, the 2018 UN report has pointed out or placed Moscow on the top of that list uh, of smart cities. And indeed, Sabianyan, uh, since um, him coming to power, has invested much research, uh, much resources into digital governance. Uh, and, um, you know, these uh, digital platforms such as Active Citizen and uh, Crowd Mosru and Gorod Mosru, Moscow, our city, all these uh, different platforms uh, are aiming at getting feedback on various um, uh, issues, a lot on infrastructural issues in the city, including roads and housing and courtyards, but also allowing uh, citizens to vote on specific issues, you know, what type of street you want on your courtyard, et cetera. Uh, and uh, there, uh, there is a large um, usership of these uh, portals. Um, Gorod Mosru site reports over 1.5 million portal users and indicates that over 3.9 million complaints have been resolved since 2011, right? So we are talking big numbers here. Uh, an application to report potholes was introduced in 2012 uh, in Moscow and then merged with this larger platform, Gorod Mosru, in 2013. Uh, there is an interesting uh, history to that that I can touch on. There, is, uh, there used to be a Rosyama Navalny's uh, application portal for reporting potholes. And in a very interesting um, uh, case, uh, Sabanian basically took over and, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, Rosyama is not quite operational anymore. Uh, I think Moscow mayor has been able um, may, uh, Moscow authorities have been able to sort of uh, capture that uh, potential resource that was seen as, uh, as an interesting um, uh, way, uh, an interesting mechanism for developing civic activism in, in Russia by Navalny and his team. So th that, that has been a loss for them and a gain on the part of Moscow authorities. Anyway, so it has been there since 2013. And what we did very quickly, we basically had panel data on um, 2013 mayoral elections and 2018 mayoral elections, and we have gathered um, uh, data from pothole complaints between 2012 and 2019, which uh, which uh, involved ar around a bit more than 200,000 pothole complaints. And um, looking into the municipal level analysis of how these pothole complaints uh, in different municipalities. Uh, correspond to um, uh, voting results in mayoral elections, uh, what we found that there is a very big value added, political value added for uh, Moscow mayor from uh, this system of uh, collecting pothole complaints and reacting to pothole complaints uh, with uh, potentially a competent and effective system of, um, uh, you know, reacting, basically fixing the potholes in the city. Uh, the analysis of these complaints revealed that um, uh, each pothole complaint is associated with additional 29 to 44 votes for the incumbent and 18 to 27 votes increase in the margin of victory. So when we ask the question, why do they invest into these digital, uh, 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 digital means of governance in uh, uh, in local governance in, in Russia, one uh, potential answer that comes from Moscow and from Moscow's management of roads and pothole complaints is that, in fact, um, uh, you know, it, it serves politically uh, Moscow mayor to, uh, to, to use this system of um, crowdsourcing or accumulating information on potholes. And now the question is, what uh, what, what's the causal mechanism behind this? And we see a potential for a simultaneous work of two mechanisms or uh, a separate work of two mechanisms, but let me just go over that also quickly. One mechanism is that um, basically uh, the uh, Moscow mayoral authorities accumulate information and have a system for quick reaction and filling these potholes, basically, right? So organizing um, the services in such a way that there is a quick reaction to, uh, to these complaints so that citizens see how quickly and competently 
uh, city authorities react to these complaints. Now, the issue of pothole complaints is important around the world, not only in Moscow. For Moscowites with you know, traffic issues, with uh, a lot of uh, increasing number of cars on the streets, and caring about their cars, this has been also an important issue. So we, we need to think about, you know, that potholes, uh, I mean, road quality is an important thing for Moscow com commuters. So um, if uh, Moscow authorities can show, uh, you know, uh, quick reaction to these complaints, then this is one um, potential element basically of how potholes could be used to demonstrate performance, right, so, and to seek performance-based uh, legitimation. So we, we thought about this as one potential causal mechanism. And the second potential causal mechanism is something that also Sabanian himself and, and Moscow authorities have um, announced as, you know, their aim of involving citizens in co-production of public goods, in managing their cities, in becoming owners of their city, so that, um, you know, this participation uh, and engagement, uh, you know, potentially could be seen as providing uh, Moscow residents with a sense of ownership of their city and therefore developing a sense of trust to the government. That that would be a second uh, potential, you know, just that, that using, that having something to do with, uh, you know, paying attention to how your city looks and being able to you know, to, to participate in making for a better city could make residents feel better and therefore trust authorities. That's sort of the second causal mechanism that we were thinking about. And there is there are some studies of um, other type of engagement-based, participation-based, participatory forms of governance in other parts of Russia that have shown that when citizens, rural citizens, city folks involved in creating in identifying problems and creating solutions that the trust to government uh, local government increases uh, there there are some studies that um, that that have done so so uh, uh, you know and in turn uh, my you know i uh, we haven't yet made a ch i think there is a way to see how this could be working simultaneously uh, our uh, initial take on this actually shows that um, when you know you can compare the degree of competence and the quickness, the effectiveness of repairs of potholes across municipalities. And as the time for repair grows, the uh, vote for incumbent falls, which basically points to this performance based um, uh, causal mechanism at work. Uh, in, in Moscow. And we also do know that indeed uh, huge resources have been invested into creating a well working system of managing the roads, a lot of resources into transportation management in Moscow, uh, and uh, which, which has caused a lot of criticism in terms of how much resources have been invested. Uh, but uh, at least if we look from the potholes perspective, this, this seems to bring political dividends to, to, to mayor. Uh, at the same time, we do know just in other countries, um, you know, just being able to complain about potholes doesn't bring at all uh, trust and support for the incumbent. There is an interesting work on San Diego by um, Kogan uh, and, uh, published in 2018 or 19, where basically pothole complaints are associated with dampening the support for, uh, for the incumbent in San Diego. So just having means of complaining doesn't bring uh, incumbent support or support for the incumbent in in other uh, in other contexts. Uh, so uh, you know uh, the thinking here is probably that in order to um, uh, to gain that additional support, the government needs to show reaction, so some degree of responsiveness to to these complaints, and um, the numbers that we get in terms of one pothole complaint gaining an additional you know a range which is much more than one in terms of additional votes what uh, it led us to think is that it's not the link between the person who complains and him seeing that the pothole is filled and him going and voting for Sabanian. no but the thinking is that there are hundreds of moscovites that are going around the, or driving near those potholes right and which as potholes disappear within three four five six, seven days, 
right? The, the, this becomes a demonstration effect who works for more than one person who complained about it. So, uh, so this engagement works to, again, as a demonstration effect um, to, um, to show how good uh, Moscow government is in terms of responding to, um, to citizens' complaints. Uh, on on the roads, so this is this is basically the the short story of uh, how potholes could be used by uh, local governments uh, in authoritarian systems. In fact, to build uh, greater support and legitimize their rule, if if uh, a system effective system of managing and responding to these complaints is organized, and Moscow seems to be the case where that effective system has been actually built. And in that sense, it brings uh, back uh, Valodia's observations about the pockets of uh, good government, government and digitalization being seen as one of those directions where the Russian government uh, sees uh, a potential in terms of trajectory for developing a better uh, public service provision style um, government in Russia. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gunas, for your presentation. And now I would like to give the floor to Judy. Hey, right. thanks very much, uh, Marlene. I'm going to go to another specific case and talk about governance in the health sector in Russia. So I'm hoping everyone is seeing my PowerPoint screen now. Um, and I'll start with the observation that the pandemic has brought a lot of attention to Russia's health sector. Questions about response capacity, renewed conversations about health sector reform. And this word reform is a really loaded and politically charged word, given the multiple different lines of argument about reform that have been happening in Russia over the last really three decades, um, going back to um, even before the Soviet collapse. Um, and there's there's a lot behind this word reform, but really the arguments about reform can boil down to two separate camps. And they're not mutually exclusive. They're not uh, opposed to one another necessarily, but there's a dramatically different emphasis in the way people talk about health sector reform. Um, from the one side, health sector reform means you just spend more money on health care. This is a traditionally under-resourced sector, and reform means just bringing the sector up to, uh, up to international comparators in terms of the amount of money that's spent. Um, a second way of looking at reform, though, talks about making better use of the resources that you have. It's more of an efficiency argument. So let's talk about those two separate lines of conversation on reform and what they mean in the Russian context. And first start with the observation that Russia does spend quite a bit less on healthcare than comparator countries in Europe. So you can see a handful of, of major European comparators here. Um, I also throw in Kazakhstan, which obviously spends quite a bit less than, than Russia does, but even Ukraine, um, you know, spends a little bit more per capita on, on, uh, on healthcare than Russia does. Um, if you look, though, at Russian healthcare spending over time, um, it's fairly consistent. Um, even in times of economic downturn, like in 2009, they, they kept up with spending um, on reform. And the Russian government would actually say, in terms of this avenue of reform, spending more money, that they've actually done quite a bit, um, dating back to the mid-2000s with the first National Priority Health Project under Medvedev. Uh, they invested quite a bit in, in a handful of targeted areas in healthcare. And then there's a pretty consistent array of new health programs that have been in place ever since then. And I haven't listed them all here, but we're up to the new demographic and health projects um, in effect under the, the current list of of national projects. So on paper, the government would say, we've actually spent quite a bit of new money in healthcare, and we've invested that money into a set of priorities that on paper actually looks like it makes sense, looks like it's tackling the most pressing health and demographic challenges facing the country. And there have been some visible results. So if you look at the picture on the left, you can see this is a health facility that uh, has been treating COVID patients. So this is from Moscow sometime over the last couple of months. And you can see modern equipment, modern facilities, well-protected health professionals with personal protective equipment. Uh, you know, th this looks like a health facility that you would see pretty much anywhere else in the developed world. But then again, we've all seen the pictures like the one on the right. Um, and this is a picture of COVID patients in Dagestan from back in April. And this was a picture posted on social media, so it's a public image. Um, and this is a picture that goes along with the repeated horror stories that we've heard about the health sector in Russia, particularly since 
COVID has, has struck. Um, so hospitals in rural villages that have been left without care, um, hospitals have closed. Um, the accounting chamber report from last year that talked about a large percentage of hospital facilities not having centralized heat, not having hot water, not having running water at all. And so the other meaning of reform often gets blamed for that. So let's talk about that particular kind of reform. The reform that says you don't necessarily need more money in the health sector, you just need to make better use of the resources that you have. And the fundamental conceptual underpinning of that line of thinking says that you need to correct imbalances in the institutional structure and in the incentive structures around healthcare so that you're not wasting these valuable scarce resources that you have. Uh, the reason for this imbalance or the character of this imbalance goes back to a stunningly long lasting legacy of the Soviet system where success is based on inputs. Success is based on just the numbers of things that you're bringing to bear in the sector. So hospitals are rewarded for having more people in more beds for longer periods of time. Um, this is a model of health care that neglects preventive care, neglects primary care, um, neglects all the places where you can catch illness earlier, and therefore you can treat illness much less expensively. So in this model that prioritizes hospitals and prioritizes numbers of things, Quantity doesn't necessarily translate into quality of care. The emphasis on numbers comes at the expense of incentive structures that would get anyone in the system to actually pay attention to health outcomes, to, to whether or not people are actually being effectively treated when they get sick. It's a bloated hospital network that doesn't actually buy you very much health. Uh, and so you can see with the numbers here that Russia does indeed have um, more hospital beds per capita than most European countries, um, except Ukraine. Again, we see the legacy of the Soviet model here. Um, and I don't have a slide for the number of doctors per capita, but it's the same pattern that in comparison with uh, just about every other rich country in the world, Russia is over hospitaled and it's over doctored. Um, you can see this also in the average, le average length of hospital stay. People stay in the hospital for longer on average in Russia than just about anywhere else in the world. Um, Russia actually has the third largest uh, numbers on this chart um, after Japan and Korea, which are completely different stories that are operating uh, on different rules of the game. Um, the important thing here is that they're not getting any better health outcomes for all of this investment in doctors and hospitals and lengthy hospital stays. So if you look at life expectancy at birth um, for 2018, you can see that Russia's life expectancy, which is much better than it was, say, 10 years ago, it's been on a steadily upward trajectory. And yet even by 2018, Russian life expectancy is significantly lower than in all of these other European countries that have fewer hospitals and fewer doctors per capita. Um, Bloomberg does an annual ranking of health sector efficiency that measures, using a couple of different indicators, how much health a country is actually buying for its health care dollars, and it ranks a few dozen different countries, and Russia consistently comes in dead last on this health care sector efficiency ranking. Um, I should also note with an asterisk that the United States consistently comes in next to last on this Bloomberg ranking for a whole different set of reasons than, than Russia's problem. So we can talk about that if, if you're interested. So in Russia, health economists have been saying for decades that reform of health care, sure, maybe it means putting more money into the system, but more importantly, the health economists tell us you need to quit wasting the money that you have. So you need to increase the efficiency of the system. You need to beef up primary care. You need to cut down the number of hospitals. You need to reprofile that excess hospital capacity into more long-term care facilities, more rehabilitation centers, more outpatient diagnostic centers, um, more, more institutions that are more efficient at delivering the kind of care that actually prevents illness or treats illness and disease and injury much more efficiently than long stays in hospitals. So what has Russia actually done along this efficiency-oriented measure of reform? And the answer is, the answer is that they have gone at least part of the way uh, down this road, um, at least in terms of closing hospitals. You can see that in terms of hospital beds per thousand population, uh, they've decreased quite a bit over the, last, um, over the last 20 years. So a couple of notes here. One is that all of the countries in the post-Soviet space have had these same conversations 
and have gone through these same reforms, some much more than others. But, but this is a common set of dynamics in all of the post-socialist countries over the last couple of decades. And it's been controversial everywhere, right? Hospitals provide a lot of jobs. So there's an employment dimension here. Um, the head doctors of these facilities have a lot of political influence. So there's an enormous political dimension to these reforms and there's money involved. Politicians make a lot of money skimming off the top of hospitals uh, of these facilities and, and skimming off the top of the big equipment purchases. So there's a corruption dimension to the uh, to this conversation. And in the Russian case, they've done this hospital optimization. They've achieved these reductions in hospital beds per capita almost entirely by closing small rural hospitals, the hospitals that have maybe 30 to 35 beds each. And those hospitals were inefficient from a health economist perspective, but closing them has left thousands and thousands of people, thousands of villages without any access at all to hospital care, or in some cases, even to health care at all. And they have little means to travel to a larger facility uh, when public transportation doesn't exist, when the road networks are awful. So this is translated into a significant problem in access to care, even though these small hospitals that have been closed were awful in terms of the quality of the infrastructure, the availability of decent equipment, at least they were something. And rural populations have been cut off now from that access. So this definition of health reform, hospital network rationalization designed to increase efficiency, made a lot of sense to the health economists, um, made a lot of sense to the people in the Ministry of Finance, made a lot of sense to the donors like the World Bank, USAID, but it's definitely not been popular with, with many people. So where does that leave us when COVID hits? Well, Russia's approach to COVID in general has illustrated kind of this brute force quantity of stuff approach to the practice of medicine. So um, Medusa is getting a lot of uh, play in our panel today. Um, if you look at a, a big report from Medusa yesterday on what's happening with uh, with healthcare and diagnosis of COVID as Russia is now well into the second wave of COVID infection. And the story in Medusa was all about the um, about wait times for TC, CT scans. So you can see some of the quotes from this Medusa report yesterday. Um, shortages of CT scanning equipment and, and services to diagnose people with COVID. But have you heard anybody in the United States talk about using CT scans to diagnose COVID? In fact, the American College of Radiology says that CT scans and x-rays are not an effective way to diagnose COVID. Um, CT scans can't distinguish between COVID and the flu or other respiratory infections. Um, lots of people with COVID actually present with completely normal CT scans. Um, and the use of CT scanning equipment is a really efficient way to transmit COVID from one patient to the next or to healthcare workers. CT scans are also comparatively really expensive. A CT scan on average costs about $3,000 a pop. A regular COVID test is somewhere between one and $300. So we're talking about an order of magnitude difference in costs, but this brute force kind of blunt instrument approach to diagnosing COVID um, illustrates sort of the bring more resources to bear on the problem culture of Russian healthcare. It's this stunning continued reach of the, uh, of the Soviet legacy. Um, it also circulates a lot of money for expensive equipment. So surely that corruption element is part of the equation as well. Um, so the last point I wanna make here is that the experience with the pandemic um, you know, illustrated with the CT scanners it is reopening a conversation about what exactly health reform means or should mean. And it's calling into question everything the health economists have been saying about this optimization or downsizing approach with hospitals. Um, and not just in Russia, you know, hospital networks everywhere in rich countries try to save money by using a just in time approach to capacity, right? You need to have exactly the number of hospital beds that you need and no more than that because you don't want to spend any more money than that. Um, the biggest push for uh, questioning this model now is actually coming from the Scandinavian countries and, and not from, from Eurasia. Um, so what people are starting to say now is this approach that's all about efficiency and minimizing expenses actually takes away from your surge capacity. You know, if you downsize and optimize, you're getting rid of the surge capacity that you might desperately need in the case of an unanticipated global pandemic.
So there are a lot of people in Russia, which actually hasn't gone quite as far down this hospital optimization road as some other countries in the region. They're now saying, thank God we didn't buy completely into this optimization, rationalization, health economist argument. So Russia is definitely talking about investing more in telemedicine, electronic prescriptions, a lot of the things that have been important during COVID. But in terms of the big structural elements of the system, it's going to be very interesting to see how the uh, health system reform and optimization conversation goes from here. And look forward to taking questions. Thank you so much, Judy. I'm trying to relaunch my video, but that seems to be slow. Thank you so much, all of you, for your great uh, presentation. We have a lot of questions arriving, so I will uh, try to put them by uh, uh, topics and make different kind of packages of uh, questions. I would like to begin with question for um, Denisa and Vladimir, because people are, uh, in fact, because it's about governance and different aspects of your analysis. So there are several questions that, in a sense, uh, um, ask you also to discuss with each other about the efficiency versus the bad governance and, and how you reconcile your, your two perspectives. But Vladimir, there was, especially for you, there was um, uh, one question asking you, how is your argument different from past dependence? And what would it take to build constraints, constraint to force or to push the Russian government adopting a better governance pattern? There is also another question more about the methodology for, for you asking about your, how are you questioning or also challenging the simple existence of this uh, global indexes that are quite problematic because they are done by different country experts making assessment of national data. So the comparability of results can be an issue and just globally these indexes get a lot of criticism. So if you could also address uh, uh, this question. And uh, Denisa, for you, there was uh, also two questions. The first one about, uh, uh, do you think that the authorities actually understand and acknowledge the inefficiencies of the government system and is that a good sign uh, uh, in itself or are they just carrying only in time of crisis when they feel they need to do uh, um, uh, something? And last also question for Denisa, do you have a sense when the regime writes vague regulation versus more precise orders? And how can you uh, uh, analyze this variation? Is that by policy, by popularity of the region, or it's simply, simply the kind of complexity of the, the technocratic process? So I first would like the two of you to address this, this round of question, and then after I will have question for uh, Gunnar and Judy. Okay. May I uh, 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 take the mic? Yes, yes, please do. Yeah. Um, uh, thanks uh, to uh, all of those who raised uh, these important questions. Um, actually, I uh, uh, not uh, uh, talk about uh, historical uh, roots, uh, but uh, rather I uh, uh, tend to demonstrate that uh, historical examples of uh, improving uh, quality of governance uh, in the past in various countries uh, tell us little about uh, present day conditions. Uh, because uh, the major argument of uh, historical sociology uh, is uh, that uh, military competition among the nations was uh, historically the major driver of improving quality of governance. First, uh, there was a need of uh, uh, making more efficient uh, military. Then there was a need of improving uh, education because you need more uh, better educated soldiers. Uh, then you need uh, to uh, to uh, uh, improve uh, your uh, health uh, system because uh, you need healthy uh, soldiers and so on and so forth. But now these uh, threats of uh, major wars are more or less a uh, matter uh, uh, of the past. The same is about uh, domestic constraints uh, uh, of uh, uh, bad governance because of um, uh, because of uh, 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 use of uh, uh, uncontrolled violence and uh, uh, stiff uh, competition. This is the argument of uh, North and uh, others about uh, limited and open access orders. 
Again, uh, we do not observe uh, things like that uh, in uh, present day uh, uh, conditions. And uh, uh, my uh, argument is completely different that uh, uh, historical uh, precedents uh, tell us little about uh, present day uh, governance. Uh, regarding uh, uh, the use of international indicators, of course, uh, uh, they are uh, widely uh, uh, discussed uh, in uh, the literature and uh, uh, all of these uh, expert judgments are uh, imperfect. Uh, Madeleine, may uh, you uh, uh, allow me uh, to uh, share the screen uh, so I can uh, use uh, uh, one of the slides uh, of uh, to uh, to illustrate uh, yeah to illustrate uh, my uh, argument. Uh, so this um, uh, problem was. Uh, uh, addressed in two ways. First, uh, there was um, uh, use not of a single uh, indicator, but of different indicators uh, uh, invented by different agencies, used by uh, use of different uh, methodologies. Uh, so they may be uh, uh, wrong, but uh, they are uh, not wrong uh, similar. And, we don't uh, second, see your screen, uh, uh, Vladimir. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, this okay. is a screen sharing. Yeah. Thank you. And uh, another issue is uh, uh, dynamics. Uh, here is uh, the dynamics of indicators of regulatory quality uh, used uh, by the World Bank. And you see that uh, there was uh, quite uh, uh, a strong improvement uh, in Russia in the period of uh, early 2000s. Uh, actually, it was uh, a side effect of uh, policy reforms uh, initiated uh, during the first uh, term of Putin's uh, presidency. And uh, yet uh, there was uh, a steady decline uh, after that. So the picture is uh, far from being uh, uh, just uh, uh, monotonic uh, across, uh, across uh, the time. And uh, in uh, my view, it uh, tells us that uh, uh, quality of governance is uh, not uh, uh, a sort of uh, structural uh, uh, feature, but uh, rather uh, um, uh, agency-driven phenomenon. And uh, in my view, what Denisa uh, observed in her analysis uh, tell us uh, more uh, for this uh, agency argument with uh, uh, using of some uh, data. Uh, let me stop, uh, stop it uh, here at the moment. All right, uh, let me jump on the question that I can see. I see one question about um, the uh, sort of uh, whether the authorities actually understand the inefficiencies in the governance me mechanisms. I think that, not, and this is something that is not rela related to the stuff I presented, it, it sort of we see uh, the evidence of the authorities actually understanding the inefficiencies in the system can be absorbed in the official language, right? So we see uh, periodically we see calls for reforms, we see acknowledgement of criticism, we see so um, especially this is sort of uh, um, is used to justify some types of uh, changes, new regulations, uh, in production of new uh, sort of administrative uh, mechanisms of um, sort of uh, addressing some of the social and political uh, and uh, economic problems. So I uh, don't see this sort of um, uh, any evidence that the um, the Russian authorities, both at the regional and the federal level. I'm not aware of the deficiencies of the system. The question becomes, why do we being aware why they are more active in, a, in um, sort of using official um, means at their disposal to uh, attack those deficiencies in, in some periods of time, not in others? I think this is where uh, this uh, sort of this um, uh, sort of uh, political motivation, political will comes into play. Uh, periods of crises, uh, uh, periods following some uh, sort of significant uh, events that highlight inefficiencies, they can uh, reinvigorate the political will behind uh, those changes. And this is what we have uh, uh, sort of periods of increased uh, regulatory activity. 
Um, so, and um, going to the second question, which unfortunately I think I, I it was early in the chat. I cannot scroll all the way up, uh, so that probably that's why I don't see it. Uh, I'm just taking it from uh, Marlene's uh, sort of reading uh, uh, parts of that. Uh, it was the question about mechanisms, right? So, how do those uh, sort of political authorities and bureaucratic authorities write those official regulations? And I think sort of it, 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 I have uh, a lot of uh, sort of uh, uh, um, observational um, sort of uh, uh, analysis there, and there are a lot of very interesting micro case studies that tell us uh, sort of the process, the mechanism by which uh, the uh, corpus of regular uh, documents grows uh, at provincial and the federal level. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, with the federal um, sort of expansion of uh, regulations, uh, there are a lot of sort of competing explanations for why this is happening that we cannot address because it's a unit of one changing over time. But with provincial, um, I'm actually able to tease out the uh, the causes and figure out the explanations that are not uh, playing any causal role in explaining why those periods of accelerated uh, rulemaking uh, uh, occur. So, what I see happening is that um, you know the, the, one of the mechanism is more uh, more activism in the more legislative activism, right? So it's um, in uh, in Russia the rulemaking um, sort of uh, officially originates with the legislation, and then the uh, the bureaucratic agencies, uh, for the most part, their bylaws they reflect to the changes in the legislative framework, right? So it starts with the statutory changes and then statutory, small statutory change usually sort of galvanizes a lot of uh, changes in bylaws that ex sort of that provides the actual basis for the executive agencies to carry out the uh, prescribed sort of policy that originates at the, at the legislative level. So um, this is sort of one mechanism uh, that we need to, um, this is the standard mechanism. Um, and in order to understand why we see more uh, sort of uh, activism in the legislature, uh, there is there is a political dynamics, right? So uh, looking at the regions that have created a lot of regional laws and bylaws, usually those are uh, regions with more sort of vibrant political life. The, uh, usually those are the regions that um, are able to um, sort of uh, regions in which we see the presentation of some underlying economic and special interests being translated into the regional uh, gov uh, government authorities. Uh, so there is politics behind it, clearly. Uh, but uh, on top of the politics, there's also intra-agency kind of uh, dynamics. There are some uh, agencies in some regions that are more active in creating those regulations and some that are less active. And there might be- Dimitra, can you be short? So we have yeah, time for so more questions. Yeah, so I just wanted to make one point here. So uh, my, uh, my research shows that regions that have higher levels of administrative capacity, that have more resources at the disposal of, of their uh, bureaucracies, they benefit much greater from the expansion of official regulatory uh, rules and regulations. And I think that is a very sort of fascinating finding that tells us about the mechanism of how this, this regulatory state uh, develops. Thank you so much, both of you, for your uh, answering this question. Now I have a round of questions for uh, Gulnaz and uh, Judy. Gulnaz, there was two questions also, especially for you. One asking you if you study uh, a similar online application for citizen complaints in democratic countries and how does that work and how would you make the comparison with Russia? And another question also asking you if uh, your demonstration seeks to explain the number of regulations relation to economic development. Oh, sorry, sorry, I'm, I'm moving to another one. Um, sorry, I lost it. Uh, Peter's question, right? 
No, no, I wanted, um, yeah, we, I wanted to have uh, Peter's question for, for the, <laughs> the last one. Um, I'm sorry, I lost it. Okay, uh, it will, I will find it again. And then there was a question for Judy about uh, what do we know about the primary care system and how it is reformed or how it is functioning in Russia uh, today? Yeah, if I can jump in first on Yulia's question with regard to uh, other online platforms. One of the interesting, uh, you know, tricks about these online platforms is that these are technologies available, right, for adoption in various countries, and they're absolutely not really linked to the democratic or authoritarian nature of regimes. These are technological solutions, and these solutions are pretty similar, and that's the strength. And if we look at, you know, the strength of programming, you know, in countries like Belarus and Russia, you have really strong uh, mathematicians and Soviet legacy sort of school of mathematics and programming, and therefore these informatic solutions are could be probably thought of sometimes even uh, you know at least in Moscow St Petersburg in bigger cities with higher human capital could be much more effectively efficiently organized than in other uh, democratic cities for example right but um, just a quick look into you know how these uh, platforms work they are you know basically you have a mobile app on your phone uh, where you usually register with your phone number or with your email and you basically take a photo of the problem and send it into that app and usually these applications are not just for roads they could be linked to other infrastructural issues in your city and they work pretty similarly whether it's san diego or washington dc there was actually uh, my co-author nisan sent an interesting article from dc dc 311 is the application for complaints uh, in washington Washington DC and potholes apparently again weather related just like in Moscow but uh, there are big issues uh, with uh, you know the lack of resources to respond to all the pothole complaints that were really high around 2019 I think so very interesting application right so that brings me so the applications are similar themselves but what is different is the amount of resources that governments, state authorities have to respond effectively and competently, right? And the resources are both financial nature and human capital type, right, nature. And that's what brings me to um, Peter's uh, question about, are we talking about different countries? So uh, in our work, we do place a caveat that we're talking about Moscow, right? And, you know, if uh, with regard to Moscow resources, Natalia Zubarevich, one of the foremost experts on regional politics in Russia, has suggested Moscow is not just rich, it's filthy rich, right? So this is one important condition, right, of what we could refer to as responsive authoritarianism. And this is another term that has been developed with regard to China that on specific when, so we can think about what are the conditions under which uh, state authorities would work towards efficiency and effectiveness and responsiveness. These are the conditions conditions, specific conditions, when the authorities are afraid of collective action, right? And in Russia, collective action, fear or danger of collective action is highest in Moscow, in St. Petersburg, in big cities. So there is greater attention to both involving and investing lots of resources into this responsiveness, but also delivering on those, right? So number one, uh, 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 resources that are required. Number two, and this is Denise also mentioned the importance of bureaucratic competency, right? That's what I mentioned, human capital, right? And this is the capital of the both bureaucracy, having educated people working and being able to use and respond and being part of effectively organized systems, but the costs are very high and we are not I'm not, I wasn't talking, this is a whole new subject, the political economy of corruption on Moscow transportation roads, right? It does work with elite rents as well, right? So the costs of an efficient state in Moscow, of efficient local governments in Moscow is much higher than the cost of an efficient government in a probably democratic city where corruption is less, right? So you need much higher degree of resources, but I'll stop at that. But I think I gave some ideas with regard to Peter's question that it's not universal, that uh, there are different Russias. Thank you. Judy. Yeah, thanks for the question about, uh, about primary care. So in order for a country to do what the health economists tell them they have to do and undergo these 
hospital rationalization processes, you do need to beef up primary care first. You have to get the sequencing right. You can't take the hospitals away without having first built up a primary care network that provides adequate care to substitute for the inefficient care that people have been getting in hospitals. And the national projects in Russia have designated quite a bit of money for uh, beefing up primary care clinics, training primary care and family doctors. So this has been recognized as an issue. And yet there are still quite a few entrenched interests um, in the personnel in the hospitals, that the networks of specialists that don't want to give up the, uh, the virtual monopoly that they've had over, over many different kinds of patient care. And to tie this into the broader theme of this discussion, they also haven't been very successful in most parts of the country in building up the kind of regulatory frameworks that would require patients to take certain pathways of care that would send them first to primary care before they jump automatically to hospitals. And, and there is something still of a, of a cultural norm or set of habits when people need care that, that's still left over from that Soviet legacy where you know, if you get sick, your first instinct is to go to a hospital rather than to what's perceived as an inadequate network, network of primary care. We see this with COVID. Um, in Russia, the hospitalization rate for COVID is almost an order of magnitude higher than it is in, for example, the United States. And that's not because uh, Russia's COVID cases are more severe. Um, you know, it's not because they need more hospitalization. It's just the habit, um, I think, of both people and of the healthcare system to hospitalize cases that would be treated through primary care in other parts of the world. That's dangerous in an, in an infectious disease pandemic because you're basically sending people into hospitals where they're more likely to spread infection or even to uh, to, to pick up infections. So um, this is a big part of the conversation now in, in thinking about investment moving forward in Russia's system is not only how to invest more effectively in primary care, but how to create legislative and regulatory structures that steer people into those private care or um, primary care networks. Thank you so much, both of you. I found the, the, the question I missed for Gudnaz that was about um, does your theory fix to explain the number of regulations relation to economic development or as a mean to constraint? mobilization and protest activities. So, Gunnar, I would like you to address this question. And then after, I would like to give the floor back to all of you. One of the interesting aspects of uh, Peter's uh, Rutland question was about this kind of what seems to be a contradiction between bad governance and effective administration that we, that we are discussing now in Russia, that you partly addressed it, especially Gunnar, about discussing the specificity of Moscow of some region so we, we see the, the regional differences in Russia, but what about maybe other dissociation like state performances and private sector performances? Can we also see two different Russia depending if we look at public or, or private sector? So if you could also maybe each of you, depending on your uh, specific topic, address this question, that would be a nice way, I think, to, to sum up the discussion. So first, Gunnar, back to you and then the floor to for everybody for a really short kind of final comments. Yeah, so I'll just go back to this idea and it, it is a theory of responsive authoritarianism that has been developed again using the case of China first. And um, now we're trying to extend it to uh, to the case of Russia. But the, this theory, it does raise an issue of what are the conditions under which the government of an authoritarian state would be prone to thinking about responding to public will, responding to, um, you know, uh, improving uh, public goods provision and sort of working in a, this positive direction. What are the conditions, right? And already in uh, studies of China have shown that this happens in the situations when um, there is a, a high risk of collective action, right? And um, this also uh, works for in the context where the questions that are under, you know, uh, uh, the issues that are under question here, and we're talking about roads, right? The issues under question are not political. It's not about, uh, you know, elections. It's not about uh, redistributing big sums of money or privatizing or nationalized big resources, right? So this is really an issue of filling potholes. You couldn't imagine the more mundane issue, right? And so uh, it's, it's sort of a, a relatively simple thing to do to fill a pothole. If you think in terms of, you know, um, 
will that work? Will that can that efficiency could be created in a healthcare system, right? Which requires knowledge, education, uh, you know, structure, technologies, etc., etc., etc. These are a bit different level of uh, types of public concerns and public uh, things, public issues, right? So, and when transportation and uh, pothole filling and good roads building requires so much resources i mentioned it's very costly it, it's much more costly than in many other contexts you could think about how creating a more efficient system say in healthcare sector or in education or in other things that people worry about and care about it will require even more resources so so there are i guess you know, this um uh, the, the, this theory of um uh, response of authoritarian speaks to uh, you know uh, just um, very uh, narrow conditions under which these things do work and could be recognized. But but you know what we're showing is that there are political effects even of filling potholes on time. Thank you so Thank you much, so Gunas. And now back the floor back maybe by the order of presentation. If you have a last few comments on this question of this kind of multiple Russia and the differences maybe. Maybe not only regional, but maybe between state performance and private actors' performance. Denisa, very briefly. Well, it's a it's a fascinating uh, issue. You know, I, I do some uh, comparative research for the regions, and yes, there are many Russians, right? Um, and um, you know, it's it's the issue of uh, state capacity. Uh, for for me, that looms large uh, uh, as an explanation for why we see different uh, Russias in terms of the living standards, in terms of the quality of governance, in terms of the quality of roads, infrastructure, uh, healthcare out outcomes, and things of the, uh, that sort. So for me, it really boils down to an even spread of resources and investments in the quality of governance. Thank you. Vladimir? <coughs> Yeah, uh, actually, uh, there is uh, a paradox uh, that among uh, different uh, indicators uh, of quality of governance uh, used by uh, various agencies, the only one uh, uh, where Russia uh, stands uh, more or less uh, uh, according to uh, our expectations uh, of uh, uh, social economic development is uh, effectiveness of government. In other words, uh, the uh, quality of uh, Russian bureaucracy is uh, not that much bad, and uh, it uh, operates uh, relatively decently in uh, some uh, policy areas. Uh, and uh, actually, the question is uh, why uh, it is uh, performed better in uh, some policy areas, uh, but uh, not uh, in uh, others. Uh, it was to be uh, explained, uh, my explanation is uh, more or less uh, similar to those of, of Gulnas, uh, because uh, uh, there is a, a, a huge difference uh, in terms of uh, 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 conduct of uh, uh, various policies. For uh, macroeconomic policy, you don't need uh, uh, um, uh, collaboration uh, of a lot of people. There should be a handful of people in the central bank and in the Ministry of Finance, and if they uh, speak the same language and understand uh, the same uh, practices, it's all right. Uh, when you have to uh, conduct a, a healthcare policy, you need to involve uh, a lot of uh, actors uh, with different capacities, different resources, different uh, uh, approaches, and it is much more difficult uh, than uh, for uh, macroeconomic policy. So agency matters. That's it. Thank you so much, so much. Vladimir. Gulnaz and Judy. I think I've, I've, I've said what I wanted. <laughs> Thank you, goodness, Judy. Yeah, and I, I wouldn't disagree with any of the points that have been made so far. It's very tempting to look at the differential situation with healthcare quality in Russia, and just talk about rich versus poor regions or rural versus urban regions. But that's not it. It really is a matter of capacity, um, and and 
you know, healthcare is a lot more complicated than filling potholes. So, you know, just to piggyback on, on what everyone else has said, when you look at the tremendous regional variation across Russia and ask what is it that's determining that differential capacity, and we see it with COVID, you know, there are some poor regions that are doing uh, much better with the response than some of the wealthier regions. Um, and, and it's remarkable in how many cases it boils down to the uh, to the education and the and the uh, innovation of just a small handful of individuals in the sector who are able to uh, sort of mobilize all of the different uh, stakeholders and constituencies that have to be involved in healthcare reform and and push through policy windows to get innovative things done. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, all of you, for this really great presentation of your ongoing research. I think uh, we enjoyed it a lot, and there was some other uh, question that I didn't have time to ask, so I apologize uh, for that. I invite everybody to uh, stay in touch with us. Next week, we will be discussing what's new under the sun, military affairs in U.S.-Russia relations. And so once again, thank you to our four, thank you to our four, four speakers and to our participants and wish everybody a very nice uh, week and see you very soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you everyone. Thank you, Marlene. Thank you.